Today we're going over community questions. I asked on Facebook for some questions. You guys gave me some questions, so we're gonna answer those questions. It's as easy as that. <laughs> if you didn't hear yet, we're currently running a Black Friday slash Cyber Monday sale on the website. 25% off everything on the website. There's a link in the description for more information on that. Let's just jump into the first question. What do I do when I can't get an auto tracker right when trackers fail? Okay, so I'm not really sure which trackers we're talking about because there's actually a lot of trackers within DaVinci Resolve. We have trackers in Fusion and then we also have trackers on the color page. Uh, they both kind of work. Actually, they both work extremely different because even Fusion has multiple types of trackers. You know, they have 3D camera trackers, they have planar trackers, they have normal trackers. Um, so some of them do 2D, some of them do 3D, some of them try to recreate where the camera is in three-dimensional space if you're you know um adding something in that you know was never a part of the scene then we also have the color trackers which for the most part are like 2d trackers but then they also skew for 3d uh, so it's kind of i'm not exactly sure so let's just go into the into the uh color one and typically what we'd be tracking are power windows so if we take a power window and let's start to track this particular area here what we're going to first be doing so i'm going to point it here and just because we're going to get a little bit of the house and then a little bit of this edge down here and if we start to track this one thing that you'll start to notice is now our you know once oval is becoming a very skewed oval right and that might be good and it might be good for a couple of reasons if you're adding a color grade in here and you're picking a particular portion you want you know, whatever you've picked initially to be in there so maybe i wanted this portion to be colored and then the top of the building to be colored um, obviously this wouldn't be a way in which you would you know be color grading but what it's doing is it's trying to maintain all the areas that were uh, initially picked to stay in there and to do that because of how this camera is moving is it has to skew that right so that's what it's doing and as you've seen when we were tracking it's just making a whole bunch of points of contrast and then it's continuing in those and it's also adding in points that are uh, closely associated with the points that it initially made so this is one way of doing it the other way you can do it is you can do a point tracker where we come down here and then when we would come into here we're in point tracker we come down here and now we can pick our points that we want to track so whatever point you can start to track that particular point we won't get the skewing or anything like that uh, but you can pick your points and then you can constantly keep adding in points this is a manual process if you're not if your point if the cloud uh, tracker isn't working this is a way that you can do it and then you can always just move in the shot wherever you want and start retracking from that particular area as well. The other thing you can do is, so currently if we're on clip and we were to move this, what's going to happen is this tracking data is still going to be applied to this and it's still going to move in the same way. It's just that now I just made an adjustment across the clip. So if, as I play this, it's now doing that same thing, but across the clip compared to if I would come back and we go over to frame now what's going to happen is every time i move this it's going to readjust itself so as i come in and i move it right now i'm doing it a per frame basis on how i want that particular uh, power window to be you know affected um, going into the future am i just changing this for this particular frame on or am i changing it for the whole clip um, so that's kind of how those would work they kind of get in depth on how you know i i typically tell people to start to turn off different things if your tracker is not working so it has less to track you can always add them in later but that is a thing if we come over to fusion like i said fusion has a ton of different trackers uh, i'm just going to try to quickly go over uh, one of them, which is the commonly used tracker. I don't know why that didn't add. So I add this tracker in and we get this little guy up here. And how to, how to, how to simplify this is this tracker, this first little, when we click this little guy here and we pick this area, we're first picking a pattern, right? We're saying, okay, I want this to be what you're looking for as the shot goes on. And then we have this outside ant trail and that's saying, your next point where you're going to be tracking, you can only look in the confines of this 
for something that is similar to the pattern you were previously looking at. So if we were to currently have this set as one, so every every frame, <clears throat> it's going to be looking in the in the in these parameters. And the reason why you're doing that is because if I was to make this real big, we can see that we have three different um, situations here that are going to look the same. So we have this building here, this building here, and this building here. As we go through the shot, this might look the same as this because now this is skewed a bit, right? So um, when if, if we were to jump this a lot uh, with our points and we had this bigger, it could start to jump into different things. So like, let's say you're tracking one eye, right? And you had that cloud big enough, uh, the area for it to track, it might jump to the other eye because they look very similar. And depending on how, from the one frame that I was tracked to the next frame, what was skewed, was there more light in one eye that got flickered on or something like that, it might skip back and forth. So it's always a balance of um, how big, how big is this uh, window that I'm allowing it to track? And then you can also change how big is the pattern that I'm allowing it to track? Obviously, this would be terrible to try to track because there's so much that's similar. But you can see here where we have all of the different two by fours and stuff creating the walls where it could make it a little easier because there's a little bit of a, of a change going on there. Um, the other thing too that I can sometimes recommend is you don't always have to track the thing in which you want to track. And what I mean by that is let's say you wanted to do one eye, right? But that eye is blinking a lot, right? So you could actually use tracking data from the other eye, maybe tracking data from the eye and the nose for if there's ever a pivot to then place something on the other eye with an offset. So there are different situations that you could go in where you could be tracking something else that has a similar movement or taking multiple track points averaging them out and then putting it on something else with like an offset so it's kind of hard to exactly say how to auto track other thing that you can do is you can increase this uh, tracker so if you have a tracker that is kind of sporadically jumping all around and you want to kind of average that out as we can see if we watch this shot through this shot isn't moving crazy fast so what we could do is we could skip and so maybe uh, from frame one to frame three, maybe the, the tracker is jumping around a little bit because it's trying to get a good average on uh, the uh, pattern that it was using. What you could do is you could spread out the track points. So when it goes from one track point to the other track point, just like keyframes, it's going to be a smooth average out when it goes from one to the other and then to the other. But if you have a lot of movement, sometimes, uh, opening up how many times it tracks, like uh, how many frames in between each track point, it can sometimes just get real sloppy and start to, to slide on whatever you're trying to track. So uh, typically it's more track points. If you're really having issues, you can come down here and instead of tracking the whole image with its tonal values and with its color values, you could you know do like just the red channel, just tonal values or just the green channel or whatever it may be. Um, so playing around with all the different tracking things can sometimes help out. So hopefully that kind of helps you out a little bit. Um, tracking gets really complex or it can get really complex. Uh, can you edit footage directly off of a NAS? Uh, to answer that simply, yes. Uh, if so, what's the configuration? So to simplify this as much as possible, cause I can quickly go on a tangent cause this is kind of stuff that I like. Uh, let's say we have our NAS box over here, right? With our little drives and we'll just put it in here uh, NAS. And then over here we have a PC, right? Doesn't matter if you have a PC, a Windows, Linux, Mac, whatever, right? It This doesn't really matter. Biggest things that you're going to have to be concerned with is obviously your drive configuration, the dr the NAS itself, how much horsepower does it have, right? Because if, you, if you're looking at some of the like lower end NAS devices, they might be able to have like two or three or four drives in there, right? But they might be using like a really low power like uh, processor, like the embedded, like I think they're called like atoms or something like that. Those processors aren't that powerful, right? You're typically just going to be sending files to it and occasionally looking at the files and throughput really isn't like a big issue. I know you were asking about like uh, hard drive speed and stuff like that. I will say if you have a big enough array and then you know, enough drives that 
tends to not be your biggest issue. Your biggest issue will be how are these two systems connected? Are they connected over a network? Is the is it a wired connection? Is it a wireless connection? And then there's different flavors of both connections. You know, if you have wireless, you have G, B, N, and then you have like A, C. And depending on how far away you are, like you're gonna have like dropout and stuff like that. So your throughput's not gonna be as high. Um, if you are on a wired connection, typical home networks are going to be like gigabit right so gigabit is going to be like a hundred at typically for the most part it's going to be like 110 megabytes per second right if you go up to like 10 gig network which is going to be uh theoretically a gigabit per second right but um you need to have some horsepower on your nas to be able to do that kind of throughput so you first have to think about okay how is our how is our whole conf you know configuration here what kind of network do we have going from our from our system to our nas right then is our nas powerful enough to deliver this right do we have encryption on our NAS? We have like all these things. How many drives do we have in our NAS? Is that all in one RAID array? Or are they all working together? So the more drives you have, and depending on the flavor of RAID array, will depict how many drives are kind of working together to get that particular file that you need, right? So if you have 10 people writing one book, that's gonna go a lot faster than one person writing the book, right? But there's little caveats here and there. Um, so if you have, let's say, uh, most NAS systems will take four to seven drives and you have 5,400 RPM drives, most footage is going to be fine. And then there's another caveat here. What kind of footage are, do you have? Do you have like, um, like a consumer camera, like a DSLR and stuff like that, that's going to be shooting like eight H.264, which is like a compressed file, meaning that the file overall size is a lot smaller. So the bandwidth that you have to have from your NAS to your PC and the amount of horsepower that you need in your NAS, you don't need to have as much uh, because the files are a lot smaller. Or are they raw files that, you know, each file is, you know, anywhere from like seven to 15 gigs big, right? Then you need more throughput because one second of footage might be you know 150 megabytes right so playing that back you would need obviously better than uh, a, a, um, a gigabit connection you might need a 10 gig connection so there's all these like little caveats that are really specific on your setup what i can typically recommend people is buy a nas that you can um always add to um so i if you have four ford bay nas there's not going to be a lot of uh stuff that you can add to that right because there's only four and then you can sometimes get like externals and stuff like that but what i typically recommend people to do is get one with bigger drives what will typically happen with most of those systems is the internals start to get a bit better um i have a whole video on like on on building a nas well not really building a nas but the software that i use uh because everything that i do every edit i do all the footage i work off of is is not on my main system it's all on this other device so but 5,400 RPM drives isn't that big of an issue if you have enough of them. So the next question is asking about codecs, uh, VP9 and color BT709. So I know some stuff, but I don't know a ton. And what I will say is uh, VP9, I believe, is a lightweight, like, web-centric codec for HTML5, if I'm not mistaken that's typically used on like uh places that that need to limit the amount of bandwidth in which you're sending a video over so like over the internet so i think like youtube uses that uh bt709 that's just a color space so that's pretty much just like rec 709 um so i don't really have a lot of uh answers to that i i believe if you wanted to export uh uh, vp9 i don't know if there's a platform that does it um but because it's so web centric i think that everything is just going to be command line based and you're just going to run a service on like a linux box to do that uh but i'm not that familiar in it so i don't have a ton of information so my next question is about uh adding clips into a timeline um so let's do that Okay, so like, let's say we have this clip here and we set all of our in and out points. You can either click this button here and like mine set for F9, it'll, wherever our playhead is, it'll 
spread everything out. I don't know if that's the action. I think that's the action that you, you want to do so that you keep all your timings down the road. The other thing you can do is if you wanted to see like all the different ways to insert footage, um, like these uh, complex in, in inserts, you can grab the footage here, you can bring it over here and it'll give you a menu of all the different ways in which that you can insert that footage that will ma manipulate the whole timeline. Cause you can obviously just drag it down. Uh, but I, I don't think that that's what you're looking for. You're looking for different ways to like uh, replace footage, uh, insert footage, um, you know, spread it out so that your the rest of your timeline doesn't get affected. And you could set those obviously for any key that you would want um, to use. So our next question is asking about the home button on the cut page. Um, the home button on the cut page is the same as the home button on every page. I'm guessing you're talking about the little button down here that looks like a home. Uh, what that actually is, is your project manager. So this is going to be where you uh, have all of your projects. So when you first start DaVinci Resolve, it's going to open this up so you start with a project. And you can come in here, you can make a new project. Um, you can also right click and you can go into dynamic project switching, which allows you to have multiple projects open. And if you have multiple projects open, you can then, uh, you'll then have up here by the name, you'll have a little drop down for every project that you currently have open and you can jump back and forth between those projects. So that's what this little home button down here does is it's like a way to see all of the projects that you have in your database. Uh, and then allows you to, uh, instead of having to close and reopen and go to a different project, it allows you to just jump to a different project. So that's how that works. All right, so our next question is, how do I morph smoothly between effects and playback speed? So I'm not exactly sure what that means. I'm going to guess you mean by like the resolve effects. So if I come into here and I would look at the uh, different effects, um, there's like your resolve effects, maybe these here, and you would be using keyframes to go from one to another. Um, in the same way in like fusion, you would use keyframes to add an effect or remove an effect. So for playback speed, I actually have mine key bound. So when I play, all I hit is tilde and then you can see up here, this was something that they just recently added just this like little icon here, but, um, I hit that and then it goes and it, you know, goes fast forward. Cause when I'm editing like, uh, my tutorials and stuff like that, I just, it needs to be on fast forward for me to be able to get through an edit. But yeah, it, it would just be into in your uh, keyboard customization and you would be able to, I think it's just referred to as fast forward. Let me see here. Yeah, fast forward. So that's all you would need to do. Just pick it and then then you would have the ability to do like the fast forwarding because um, that's not something that I actually use quite frequently. <laughs> So that pretty much covers all the questions for today. Leave a comment. Should I do these more frequently? I used to do them. Um, I haven't done them in a while. Let me know in the comments if I should do more community questions. Maybe it answers some people's questions. I know I got a bunch of them and I couldn't add them all into this video, but let me know if this is something that I should be doing more in the future. If so, then I will. Um, and uh, yeah, my website, 25% off everything on it um, till Cyber Monday. So next Monday, the second, I'll be doing that um, there. But yeah, make sure to let me know if I, if I should do another one of these. And if you, you wanna submit your question, I have a link in the description as well to my Facebook group. It's typically where I ask these questions or I ask for these questions. Uh, yeah, but with that being said, my name's JR. Enjoy the weekend and have a good one. See you later, guys.